being here. I'm just here a, a few quick remarks. Uh, one, I want to talk about Bill Clements for just a second because uh, I don't know how many of you remember this. I know Clady does, I know Modesta does. That could be one the state of Texas governorship back in 1978. And that was also the year that George W. Bush ran for Congress in this district and got beat. And um, although I would say that Midland, Texas, uh, voted for him 82 percent of the vote, so Middle Texas should have tried to get Bush in. Uh, that night, election night, um, right after it became clear he was not going to win, he called his dad up and he said, Dad, would you mind calling Governor-elect Clements and ask him if he needs a Secretary of State, which is an appointed position in the state of Texas. And so his you know, dad said, I don't, I don't think I'm going to do that. Besides that, I've already heard that, you know, he's probably going to select George Strait, which is what he wound up doing. But I, I would tell you that um, that Governor Clements, we all have such great admiration for him, and I'm thrilled that this center, this program, is being housed on the University of Texas campus. I mean, you've got programs there at your seat, and you just see the star-studded cast that, that uh, they've already signed up as directors, advisory board members, et cetera. It is going to be world class. And it will focus on national security of the country, uh, security of the world. And so it is a very important program. It's a treasure for the University of Texas to have. And speaking about treasures of the University of Texas, uh, I've got one I'd like to introduce. Before I do that, I want to tell you another quick story about uh, two of uh, George W. Bush's favorite people on the planet. One would be uh, Will and Bowden, who is the executive director of the Clements Center. He was on the president's uh, National Security Council for three years, I believe. I think it was 05 to 07 during that all-important period of what we refer to as the surge. And so you can see that he was right in the middle of some big time important decisions. And I was just talking to the president the other day about Will. He's just, uh, I don't know if Will's got a bigger fan than the former president of the United States and George W. Bush. So Will, it's good to have you here. It's great to see you again and, and so fond of you and your lovely wife and family. And, and the other great friend and uh, the president is uh, president of the University of Texas at Austin. I became chairman in 1997, uh, and that January, uh, Bob Berdahl, who was then president, uh, announced that he was resigning and going to UCAL Berkeley, and so we needed to select a president. And so I talked to the then Governor Bush, and, and he asked me, you know, how well do you know Bill Powers? He said, I've met him, and I'm really, really impressed with him, and I would really like to find a place to kind of move him up in, in the state. And at that time, Bill was a, a professor at the University of Texas Law School, uh, made the decision that probably, you know, hadn't had the, yet had the executive experience, and, and probably the next step would be dean of the law school, which in fact it wound up being the dean of the law school for some six years. And uh, then... President Powers has served as president of the University of Texas for the last nine years. He's the uh, second longest serving president of the university. It is the hardest job in America. Uh, you've got first the students, which is the most important. Then you've got faculty. As our friend Peter Flan loves to say, faculty morale is always at an all-time low. And so you've got that to work with. You got the alumni, you got super alumni, you got a, your board of regents, and then you've got, of course, uh, the legislature. So it is an incredibly tough job. We've had a man in there for the last nine years of incredible integrity, a guy that you can trust 100% of the time, and a guy that's got what you really need when you're president of a university, and that's very good, sound judgment. He says, I've watched Bill over the last nine years, just extraordinary judgment and decisions that he's made. And so we're proud to have you out here. I'll turn it over to you, but thank you, Bill. Everybody knows Bill's retiring, and, and uh, thank you. Your service has been unbelievable. It's taken the university to new heights. It's uh, your real treasure to the state of Texas. Thank you for all your service, Bill.
Well, thank you, Don. Um, that was really nice. I, I really appreciate it. And coming from you, it's all the more special. Um, well, welcome to all of you. We have a terrific program tonight, so I'm going to be brief, but I would like to just make a couple of uh, remarks. First, it is uh, always great to be in Midland. Uh, and I come out here uh, three, four times a year. Uh, there's one person here who comes up from UT who comes out more. I think our provost, Greg Fenves, and where are you, Greg? Uh, there you are. Greg, uh, I think you've set the all-time record for a uh, provost or a dean of engineering to come out to Midland. But this is such a critical part, not just of the state, but uh, uh, supply and energy and technology and new ways of doing things uh, for the world. Uh, we just got off a huge capital campaign. Uh, Midland was fantastic. So I'll just, to begin this program, I want to say thank you. Thank you to everybody in this room, and thank you uh, if the reporters are here. Thank everybody in Midland for what they've done uh, for the university. As I said, you have a, a great, great program tonight. Uh, brought to you by the Clement Center. And the purpose of the Clement Center is to study, but also to educate and train the next generation of leaders in national security. That's crucial for our country. Uh, Will M. Bowden, who I'll introduce in a moment, is the director. You'll hear from him in a bit. Uh, this has gone from idea to actually doing great things in a very short period of time. And on college campuses, that's a rare thing. <laughs> and it's due to the leadership of Will M. Bowden. Uh, it's also due to the vision and leadership and generosity of the Clements family and particularly George C., uh, who you'll also hear from later. George, uh, thank you for all that you've done for this center. And it's to honor, uh, yes, our governor, two-time governor, a great Texan, Bill Clements, but also someone who tran there you go, George. transformed the Pentagon in a way that is still paying dividends for our national security. So there are a lot of people to thank, and George, uh, you've been right at the top uh, to do that. And there's one other person here. I can't single out everybody here, but there's one other person I hope is still here. Uh, and I just want to say uh, God bless you for being back out of the hospital and back in life. Is Tom Craddock? There you are, Tom and Nadine. God bless you. Uh, so we're honoring Governor Clements. We're educating uh, leaders and studying problems in national security. You'll hear more about that in a moment. Let me say that is really good for the University of Texas. It is really good for the state of Texas. And all that's important. But what is really critical, it is crucial that we do this for America. And George and Will, thank you for bringing this to us. God bless y'all. Let me say hook him. I know you're not all Longhorns out there. <laughs> And now, let me introduce the director whose idea this was and whose perseverance and uh, both vision and management have made this come about. Uh, he came to us from the Bush administration, the National Security Council, as Don mentioned, uh, educated at uh, Stanford and Yale but to bring together this great academic but also practical approach to national security. So let me ask to come forward, Will Imboden. Okay, great, thanks. All right. Come on. 
All right. Well, thank you so much, um, uh, Don Evans and, and Bill Powers, for those very generous introductions. It's a real honor for all of us to be here with you tonight. Um, you've already heard quite a bit about the background and the values and mission of the Clements Center, so I won't, I won't go over that, but rather what we want to do is kind of dive right into some pretty important issues here. And the, um, the mission of the Clements Center is embodied by these... Uh, I call them warrior scholars sitting here next to me. Uh, each of these uh, gentlemen, great American patriots, um, great practitioners, incredible experience um, in all, all facets of national security, but also um, really excellent in the classroom. Um, these are the kind of uh, leaders that we can bring to UT at the Clement Center to be educating the, uh, the next generation of national security leaders, uh, educating your sons and daughters who are at UT now. Um, and at the same time, we're trying to stay relevant with current, uh, current national security policy. We've We've got active programs uh, helping advise the CIA on some sensitive projects, uh, working with the military on, on a number of things, working, working with the State Department. So we want to make sure that um, America's universities, at least the University of Texas, are fulfilling our duties to help strengthen our nation's national security, uh, to cultivate patriotic values, um, to make sure that the, the research and work that we're doing, whether it's teaching uh, or uh, providing new insights, is of use to our, our, our great country. So let me give you brief introductions to the background of these three gentlemen, then we're going to dive into what we're going to talk about tonight, which is the, um, uh, the war on terror since uh, from September 11th to today, what it means for our country's national security, and also what it means for energy policy. And I know that's uh, something of special uh, interest to so many of you here. Uh, so starting down here uh, is uh, General Frank Kisner, um, an adopted son of Midland, I suppose we could say, um, uh, Ernie Angelo's uh, son-in-law. Um, uh, for our purposes, General Kisner is a retired three-star uh, three Air Force general. Uh, you can read his full bio in the, uh, in the folders there, but, um, but a couple highlights. He was the deputy commander of Task Force Dagger, and that was, uh, our guys were first in Afghanistan right after 9-11. Um, so just a few days after the attack, um, he was heading east, as they say, and commanding our special operators and our CIA paramilitaries who defied all conventional wisdom and all expectations and toppled the Taliban in just a matter of months. Um, most recently, he was the uh, commander of all special operations for NATO, um, so working with our allies to help upgrade their special operations capabilities. Um, next to him is Steve Slick. Yes, that is his real name. Uh, <laughs> Steve, as far as we know. Yeah, Steve just retired from 28 years with the CIA's clandestine service, so he's out of the shadows now um, in the limelight here in Midland, Texas. Uh, I got to know Steve when we worked together for President Bush. Um, Steve was overseeing all the intelligence programs from the National Security Council. Uh, from there, he went to Tel Aviv. He was our chief of station there. Um, and as you know, that's a complicated, dangerous part of the world. And uh, we'll leave it at that. But Steve is heading up our intelligence studies project, uh, particularly providing new insights on how our nation can improve the craft of intelligence, and also uh, teaching our students on what it takes to be a good intelligence officer. Then right next to me is Dr. Paul Miller. Um, also a veteran of the, uh, the Bush National Security Council. Uh, Paul probably knows Afghanistan better than just about anyone in the world, uh, maybe next to President Karzai. You know, was, um, Paul fought there as a soldier with the U.S. Army. Um, he studied Afghanistan as an analyst with the CIA. Uh, he ran Afghanistan policy uh, for the Bush administration on the NSC staff. And he's taught about Afghanistan uh, with the National Defense University. And he's now the associate director of the Clements Center, uh, teaching classes, mentoring, uh, mentoring students, and also uh, writing a new book on the future of American strategy. Strategy. Um, and uh, so that's who you'll be hearing from, and then you've already, uh, already heard a little bit of my background. Each of us are just going to speak for a few minutes um, sharing our perspective, because you have here military, intelligence, policy, the different elements of American national security power, uh, and what we've been doing for the last uh, 10, 15 years, on, on particularly on, on, on fighting terrorism. Um, and I'll, I'll start with a little bit of a big picture overview for how the war on terror looked to the Bush administration. I was uh, in Washington on 9-11. I um, know a few others of you um, uh, probably were as well. Uh, you were, weren't you, Don? That's right. Um, and again, a day none of us will forget. I know anyone, uh, no one, wherever you were, will, will forget it, but especially for us. And uh, the, the one thing that I try to, to keep in mind is that in the days and weeks after 9-11, all of us were certain, not worried, but certain we'd get hit by another large-scale attack. And that gives you a sense for the, the gravity of it, but also just the, the fog of war. Who was this uh, awful enemy who had, who had hit us? Why, why did they do that? What were they, they planning on doing next? And I will say it's a, it's a credit to the Bush administration and the Obama administration that we haven't been hit in a big way since. Um, and that's not an accident. Um, that's thanks to 
people like these gentlemen here, many other brave Americans, uh, some of whom are no longer with us now, um, and paid the ultimate sacrifice to protect us. But, but for the Bush administration, the days after 9-11, um, a big question came up, what kind of war is this? And especially, what can history tell us about this? It's one of the uh, missions of the Clement Center is to apply the insights of history to current national security policy, because that's what our nation's leaders want. When they're presented with a new challenge, they immediately ask, have we seen something like this before? What kind of conflict uh, is this? In the Bush administration, uh, we looked at all sorts of analogies. Uh, was this like World War II? You know, Pearl Harbor was a surprise attack. We just had another one. Uh, some were saying this is going to be like Vietnam because Afghanistan could turn into a, a, a quagmire. And the analogy that the uh, that President Bush and, uh, and Condi Rice and a number of the, the Bush administration leaders settled on it was actually the Cold War. We thought that this was most like the Cold War because it had a number of elements in common with the Cold War. Um, we knew that it was going to be a long conflict, uh, that this was not going to be won easily. You look at, look at President Bush's speeches in, even in the days right after 9-11, saying this is going to be a, a very long conflict. We need to prepare ourselves for a generational fight. But it was going to have multiple dimensions. There were going to be some local hot wars. You know, the Cold War had Korea, had Vietnam. Um, but it was also going to be a, a global struggle, a lot of it taking place in the, in, in the shadows. We knew there was going to be a full spectrum conflict. We called it a war because it was a war and because our enemy called it a war when they declared war on us. And so we knew that the military was going to have to be the tip of the spear. But we knew that intelligence was going to have to play a part. Economic power was going to have to play a part. Diplomacy was going to have to play a part. Um, uh, ideological campaigns to try to prevent young Muslims from being radicalized and joining the ranks of the, of the jihadists. So just like the Cold War, we knew it was going to encompass all elements of nas uh, national power. We knew that it was going to be a global conflict, as the Cold War was. Um, yeah, it initially focused uh, in the broader Middle East and, and South Asia, but uh, we knew that there were jihadist cells operating all, all over the world, and that Al-Qaeda had global ambitions, uh, like the Cold War. And then we knew that it was going to be an ideological conflict, that it wasn't just about killing a few terrorists, because there, there was these these toxic ideas out there that were capturing their minds. And we saw that we can kill 100 terrorists, but then two or 300 more might be produced because they're being captivated by this ideology. So the Cold War was a contest between the free world and communism, and we knew that this one was going to be a contest between the values of the free world and militant Islam, militant jihadism. But we also knew that just as some radicalized Muslims were the enemy in this war, we also knew that some of the biggest victims in the war were other Muslims. Um, and we knew that some of our best allies in the war were going to be Muslims. And so we did not want it to be a war on Islam, but rather a war just on violent radical Islam, or some of our best partners were going to be uh, peace, peaceful Muslims. Um, and so that was the analogy that we drew on, but then we had to figure out how are we going to unfold this, this conflict. You know, the first, uh, the first phase was the kinetic uh, action, going to war in Afghanistan to, to topple the Taliban and other counterterrorism operations. But, uh, but pretty soon, uh, President Bush uh, started asking some questions about where do we go from here, because we're seeing more generations of terrorists being, being produced. And so that's why he started talking about the need for political and economic reform, especially across the broader Middle East. He knew that a number of the brutal dictatorships and autocracies there may have seemed stable, but that they were sitting on just a cauldron of resentment and anger and, and more and more potential terrorists being produced. And so um, in some ways, he predicted what became the Arab Spring several years before it actually happened. Um, and so we started working also on political and economic reform in those, in those countries. Um, they also knew that we uh, just couldn't use uh, conventional uh, war. This wasn't just about you know, sending in the tanks and you know, masses of, 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 of infantry, but we needed to be developing uh, new techniques, such as, such as drone strikes, um, such as fusion cells that bring together intelligence and special operators. And my colleagues here will tell you a lot, lot more about that. Um, so through the end of the Bush administration, those were the, some of the different phases that, the, that the, the, war, the war went through. And then when President Obama and his team came to power, they were still very committed to, to, to fighting al-Qaeda, um, but they wanted to dial back a lot of the rest of the conflict. And so they stopped talking about a broader war on terrorism or war on radical Islam, just talking about a war on and on core al-Qaeda, um, and, uh, and focused it on things like the, the, the drone strikes and um, trying to preserve some stability in, in Afghanistan while, while drawing down ev everywhere else. But within a few years, and as you've seen if you've uh, been watching the headlines, the, the Obama administration uh, uh, realized that their initial focus on core al-Qaeda wasn't necessarily sufficient. We had some successes. Um, our new chancellor at UT, Admiral McRaven, led Operation Neptune Spear, which killed Osama bin Laden, um, a great success uh, in, in, the, in the war against, uh, against al-Qaeda. But then we see this new group uh, uh, come forward, uh, seemingly out of nowhere, the Islamic 
Islamic State, or, or ISIS, as they're uh, being called. Now, if people who are, people who are watching closely uh, would have seen some of the roots of this, uh, that it, it had started as Al-Qaeda in Iraq, um, the, the uh, President Bush's surge had really beaten them back, but then we kind of, uh, the American government, I think, uh, took their eye off the ball for a little bit, and the Islamic State splits off from Al-Qaeda, sets up its own caliphate, um, across Iraq and, and Syria, and I, I think brought us into a new and very dangerous phase in, in this conflict. Um, and there's a few, few aspects about the Islamic State that are uh, new and unprecedented and, and very dangerous that we haven't seen before. One is that they're now this militant jihadist organization that controls a large swath of territory. Al-Qaeda never controlled territory before. Second is that they have set up a caliphate, that they're making some strong religious and ideological claims about what this, uh, what this territory represents. Um, third is that they have independent revenue streams, um, the, whether it's from kidnapping and ransoms, whether it's from, uh, from oil, oil smuggling and selling it on, on the black market, whether it's through other forms of extortion. Uh, they're becoming very wealthy. They're not just defendi de depending on the, the patronage of some radical Saudi sheikhs, uh, as was uh, the past with, with Al-Qaeda. Um, they also have a lot of Western passports. Um, there's a lot of uh, European Muslims and some American Muslims who've traveled there, have Western passports. That makes them a lot more dangerous for, for, for coming, coming back. And finally, they've launched a new phase of their global ideological offensive. They're very crafty with social media. Um, they're using you know, YouTube and Twitter and Facebook and all these advanced forms of social media to spread their message beyond, uh, beyond Iraq and Syria. That's why they're now getting a lot of adherence in Libya, a lot of adherence in Yemen, um, and a number of other another uh, troubled spots. So um, we did a conference at UT uh, uh, a few months ago with a lot of our nation's top intelligence officials, and several of them said that uh, this is the most dangerous they've seen things since 9/11, um, and it's um, it's it's very it's very worrisome. So we've now entered a, a new and new and dangerous phase in the war. Finally, just a few thoughts on uh, what this means about Saudi Arabia and the, and the global energy industry. And I've not talked about the Saudis before, but I want to share a vignette. Um, after 9-11, uh, we realized that 15 out of the 19 hijackers were Saudis. Um, they had grown up on this very radical Wahhabist ideology that's promulgated in Saudi Arabia. And um, President Bush and the Bush administration had to have some very tough, candid talks with the Saudis about, are you with us or are you against us? Are you going to be part of the problem or the solution? Are you going to be producing more terrorists or helping us fight them? And for the first couple of years, the Saudis waffled a bit. Um, they'd be with us on some things, but they were somewhat problematic partners. And uh, all that changed in May of, of 2003. And I remember this very well because I was at the State Department at the time and was uh, tasked with traveling to Saudi Arabia with a couple of other state officials to talk to the Saudis about the need to rein in their extremist ideology, uh, to stop uh, promulgating these uh, very intolerant beliefs that we thought were producing more terrorists. And two days before I was supposed to fly to Riyadh, we got a warning from our CIA station there saying, don't come. We're getting some very bad, uh, very bad warnings uh, about a possible terrorist attack. Well, two days later, that attack happened. May 12, 2003 is when Al-Qaeda in the kingdom uh, uh, bombed a number of Western residential compounds, killed about 50 or 60 people. And that was Saudi Arabia's 9-11. That was the wake-up call that Riyadh needed. Um, they realized that they'd been feeding a dragon in their own backyard. Um, and after that, they became still some problems, but they became much more reliable partners in the fight against terrorism because it hit them in their, in their own, own backyard. And fortunately, um, because we'd had some warnings, uh, that prevented a lot more uh, Americans from being killed. Now, over the time, um, Saudi Arabia, uh, you know, at, uh, in those early years, we had somewhat less leverage with them than we do now because they were the global swing producer in the petroleum markets. And, uh, and we knew that just as we were working with them and trying to get them more on side against terrorism, that we also needed them to uh, continue being, you know, one of the world's main, main petroleum suppliers. So much so that we, uh, when I was working for President Bush, he asked us to come up with some contingency plans for nightmare scenarios. What would happen with, if X country gets a nuclear weapon or this uh, American American ally is toppled in a coup or something. One of those nightmare scenarios he had us work on was a Al-Qaeda attack against the Abqaiq refinery. Uh, some of you may know in the eastern province, the Abqaiq refinery is the most active refinery in the world. Uh, you know, refines about some seven million uh, barrels of, of petroleum a day um, and would be profoundly disruptive to global energy markets if the terrorists were, after go, were able to go after it. 
Well, as we were working on this particular study of what do we do if the terrorists attack Abcake, they did. Um, this is not remembered too well, but in early 2006, Al Qaeda launched an attack on, on the Abcake refinery. And fortunately, the Saudis were prepared enough that the, the guards there were able to, to stop the, the attackers before they actually got in and did much damage. Um, but that, again, was another wake up call for the, for, for the Saudis. Um, and pointing forward, that actually shows a great advantage that we as Americans now have uh, as we are becoming the global swing producer. I know. Um, Midland's feeling, uh, you know, some of that economic hardship of uh, oil prices going so far down, uh, partly, partly uh, a, a result of the tremendous production that Midland's been leading the way on. But our, uh, our, our production facilities, our refineries, um, are not completely protected, but a lot better protected than the Saudi ones are. And, and that's, um, that's, that gives us an advantage, uh, is, is frankly a contribution that America can be, uh, can be making in, in, the war, in the war on terror. The other one, of course, is um, the, the, the shale revolution in particular has given the United States just a lot more leverage on the global stage. Paul will be talking about this a uh, little bit more, but just as I know uh, it's been hurting the economy some here, it's also really hurting the economy of a lot of our, our adversaries, like Russia, like, like Iran, like, like Venezuela, and even uh, the, the Islamic State and their, and their smuggling and their, their black market sales of oil. They're not able to get as much as they, they were before. Um, so, so in that sense, Midland uh, is playing a very important role in a much larger geopolitical struggle between the you know the, the free world and, and the terrorists between the free world and the and the tyrannies out there and uh, you've given the United States a, you know tremendous le leverage and a lot more freedom of action um, now that we're not so dependent on, on foreign sources of foreign sources of oil so um, so so thank 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 you for that you're playing a vital vital role all right enough from me we're going to turn it over to Paul and then the others here so Paul, go ahead. Uh, well, thank you, Will. That was a, a great sort of overview of the issues, and uh, thank you all for, for turning out uh, for this discussion. It's an honor for us to be able to introduce ourselves and the Clement Center to you all. It's actually very encouraging to me to see so many uh, uh, folks come out to hear a discussion about the war on terror. Um, over the years, uh, my observation has been that many Americans uh, w would, wouldn't come to something like this. It is their desire to see this war over. Uh, whether we've won or lost, uh, they're not interested in, in the topic. Uh, so thank you for sustaining an interest in what is still a very important subject. Will has uh, shared a few, um, uh, a few notes of some pessimism and a few notes of some optimism, and I'm going to reflect that uh, and, uh, and, and build upon that. Uh, I um, uh, would like to sort of offer my thoughts on the war on terror and where we are uh, right now today, and looking back at our progress to date. And uh, to be honest, my, my judgment is that we are troublingly stalemated in some key aspects of the war. Uh, troublingly stalemated in some key aspects of the war. Uh, to begin with, we have to understand what the war actually is. You know, we use this phrase, war on terror. I think it's more accurately called a war on jihadism or jihadists. I think it's unhelpful to, um, uh, to avoid uh, the specific ideological name of the groups we are fighting. It is a war against jihadists. Al-Qaeda was the most famous and most lethal group, but there are many, many others. They all believe in the same very broad ideology, and we shouldn't pretend otherwise. Uh, wherever these jihadists are, it is a threat to our interests, to our allies, to our partners, to our way of life, uh, and, it's, uh, and it behooves us to pay attention to what they're doing and whom they're attacking. Uh, the war, happily, does not require uh, uh, American troops in combat on the ground every single place where there's a jihadist. For the most part, we can uh, work with local allies and partners around the world. That's why we give assistance, weapons, uh, security training to Ethiopia, to the Philippines, to Yemen, uh, when we have the opportunity to do so. For the most part, we want to share the burden with local partners to take the fight to these jihadist groups. Uh, but we can't do that always. There are some places in the world where local partners are at risk of being overrun by the jihadists. And that was certainly the case, is certainly the case in Afghanistan. Uh, when the Taliban were able to reform their insurgency after 2005, uh, the uh, Afghans, I think, continue to require our assistance. And I think that was the case in Iraq as well, as Al Qaeda in Iraq uh, threatened to overrun the state of Iraq 2006 and 7. And so that has justified our, our response in turn. But there is yet one more aspect of the war on terror, uh, or the war on jihadists, that is important for us to note in judging how well it's going. Uh, Will mentioned that it, there's an ideological dimension to this conflict, and that's absolutely true. Uh, in order to combat a movement like these jihadist groups, we have to hold out an alternative. And that means we have to invest in partners around the world who hold up a same vision of life that we do, uh, if, uh, partners who believe in an open society. 
And that means we have to make investments in the quality of their governance and in their economies. That's gotten a bad rap in recent years. I think some people think it's impossible or can't be done, uh, and, I, and I disagree. I think that we have shown some pockets of success here and there, and, and we can get it right. Uh, and this is where I think we, we have much work to do in making more of these investments in the quality of governance overseas and societies that breed uh, the jihadist ideology. Uh, in Iraq, uh, we, uh, I think, uh, successfully beat back al-Qaeda in Iraq and the other insurgents in 2007, 2008. And we had the opportunity to have a lasting presence there, which would have bought time for us to make those investments. Uh, we could have sustained a presence which would have blunted the uh, rise of the Islamic State and could have bought us time to make more investments in Iraqi governance and society. Uh, and we lost that opportunity uh, in what is, I think, a, a remarkable failure of American diplomacy. Uh, we walked away in 2011. Uh, the uh, consequences uh, uh, we've seen over the last few years, the uh, jihadists, uh, al-Qaeda in Iraq, reformed, relabeled itself the Islamic State, and they're now the richest and most dangerous terrorist group uh, in the region and perhaps in history. Uh, that's what happens when America walks away from its responsibilities. Uh, what's even more remarkable is that I think we're almost about to make the exact same mistake in Afghanistan. Uh, in Afghanistan, things did go uh, decently well for the first several years. Uh, the Afghan economy has actually tripled or quadrupled in size, something you don't read in a lot of newspapers. Uh, democracy in Afghanistan has gone better than anybody had a right to expect 14 years ago. I, I know it's got problems. I've watched this day in, day out for years. I know it's got problems, but it is better today than we had any right to expect at the beginning of our intervention there. So uh, democracy in Afghanistan has the opportunity to, to take root, especially with President Ghani in power now. But there was a power vacuum. The Taliban regrouped and reformed and launched an insurgency. Uh, I walked around downtown Kabul in 2002. I did the same thing in 2007. It was an entirely changed city. Uh, in 2002, it was still, there's still an air of hope. The Afghans smiled. They, they walked up. They talked to me. Uh, and the city felt free and open. There wasn't a heavily militarized presence of either internationals or Afghans. In 2007, the city was bigger. There was more bustle, more activity, but it was a nervous energy. It was a, a city under siege. It was a city that was experiencing periodic ter large-scale terrorist attacks in downtown Kabul, and that's only continued in the years since. Uh, so the Taliban insurgency has uh, set back much of the early progress we made there. Uh, once again, I think the United States made the right call. Uh, President Bush, followed by President Obama, did a surge of troops into Afghanistan. Uh, it started in 2007. And then the, uh, the uh, progress, I think, has been under threat by the withdrawal of American troops there. Uh, and uh, as I said, I think we're in danger of replicating the same mistake that we made in Iraq. We're about to make the same mistake in Afghanistan. Al-Qaeda has not been defeated. The Taliban has not been defeated. And Iraq could hardly be a clearer cautionary tale of what happens when we withdraw too early. And I don't want to stay there forever. We don't have to stay there forever. We've got to stay there long enough to consolidate the gains we've made. So that's why I am a little bit uh, pessimistic, why I say we are stalemated in some key aspects of the war. Uh, I think that we have missed opportunities in Iraq. Uh, we're about to miss them again in Afghanistan. We haven't consolidated our, uh, our gains in either place. Um, President Bush said it was a long war, and it, it's not been a long time yet. You know, it's been 14 years. Uh, the Cold War was 40, uh, so a bit more patience, a bit more strategic patience, to borrow a phrase from the current administration, would, would help quite a lot right now. Now, is, this, is there a silver lining? I think I, think I can point to a few, a few silver linings. You know, obviously, there's been no, uh, no large-scale terrorist attack on the United States uh, since 2001. Obviously, we've done something right. Our homeland security has improved. Uh, our intelligence has improved. Uh, and you'll hear more about that uh, from Steve and Frank. Um, our, our special forces have improved. Our ability to do surgical strikes has improved. We have gotten some things right. Um, one of the things that has really improved our strategic position has been improvements in the United States uh, energy industry. Um, the, um, the developments in the energy industry of the last few years have really altered the equation in a lot of ways in our grand strategy. The Middle East has always been important for us because, not because of the volume of oil they have, but because of their comparative advantage in producing it so cheaply. That's the thing that's changing. 
as the energy industry here is developing new techniques that is able to get oil uh, out of the ground and sell it uh, more efficiently, and as their production costs go up, that balance changes, and the balance of power in the energy industry is shifting. It's going to take many years for this to play out. It's not, it's not there yet, but we're getting there, and I think the players in the Middle East understand that. The more we are able to build up our energy industry, the more that insulates us from developments in the region the more we are able to take a more hands-off approach to the region, and, and that's a good thing. So there is a national security aspect to what you all are doing in developing our energy industry as a country. Uh, so it is a weapon of war uh, in the war against Al-Qaeda. Our energy capabilities are. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, that, I think, is a good silver lining to end on. Again, thank you for your, your presence tonight, and I'll hand it over to Steve. Terrific. Thanks, Paul. That was great. Um, well, thank you very much for the warm welcome to Texas, to the University of Texas, uh, and also to Midland. Uh, so first on all of these counts for me, and uh, I've uh, felt uh, greatly welcomed and delighted to be here, and as Will said, uh, anxious to be in a classroom with your sons and daughters and prepare them uh, to the extent many of them are interested in going to Washington and following in our footsteps, careers in public service, careers in national security. So it's, it's very exciting what's happening at the Clements Center and on campus at the University of Texas. Um, Will asked me to do a couple of things. Just uh, take a few minutes and uh, establish a personal connection to the war on terrorism, and I'll be, I'll be happy to do that. It's certainly a searing impression for me, and I want to share it with you. Uh, I'll describe a couple of the issues, a couple of the, the challenges we faced in the intelligence uh, struggle in transforming our intelligence community to be ready to defend the nation against acts of terrorism. Uh, and then I'll close and, and frankly look forward to your questions uh, because I'm sure you have them and, and that will be much more interesting than anything I, I volunteer to you. So in terms of, uh, you know, how the war on terrorism has um, changed my life, changed my professional life and personal life. I have to tell you, I have to take you back to the very beginning. So this is 1986. Uh, I'm leaving a law firm in Philadelphia, uh, making my mother very upset uh, in doing so. And, and I went off to join the French Foreign Legion, you know, the CIA. So I want to go live overseas. This was the CIA of Ronald Reagan and Bill Casey. Uh, lots of you will remember that. Uh, Cold War is still at full throttle. Uh, and these two leaders are determined to end it. Uh, on their watch. And so um, what an exciting call uh, to go be trained as an operations officer at the CIA and assigned to the unit that's responsible for recruiting and handling Soviet agents uh, around the world. And so I was enjoying that immensely. Uh, for 15 years, uh, my family and I lived overseas in three or four different countries where I was able to work undercover uh, and um, frankly, gather some of the information that we might need from the Soviet and the Russian governments uh, in the event that World, World War III ever unfolded. And that was richly rewarding. Uh, but that all came to an end. They called me back after 15 years and told me I was going to be assigned as an assistant uh, to the director, George Tenet, uh, at the time, and the deputy director, John McLaughlin, both great Americans and, and great, great friends of mine. So I showed up uh, on the seventh floor at CIA after you know, a decade or more uh, overseas doing field work. And uh, it was uh, September 4th, uh, 2001. And uh, so needless to say, uh, seven days later, you know, on a crisp fall morning um, in the Washington area, uh, I'd barely found my way to the men's room. Uh, wasn't sure where you got lunch or what my, what my password was to get on the computer system. Uh, and I was sitting in one of my very first senior staff meetings when one of the security officers came in and said, uh, we think you need to come into the director's office and see the TV. And we all got there just in time to watch the, the, the aircraft uh, fly through the second tower uh, in New York. And uh, I'll share with you the, the reaction of the people in that room. These were the leaders of our intelligence community. Uh, that day and for the next 13 years, uh, and uh, I don't think I don't think I'll be in trouble with George for sharing this because it's a very hu human reaction. But uh, so the le senior leadership of the Central Intelligence Agency of the intelligence community are sitting in the director's office. We just watched this horrible uh, scene unfold. The first tower is now collapsing. Uh, and the director and his deputy and his team had two reactions. Uh, the first one was, 
and I excuse them for this because this is how Washington functions, was, man, they're going to come after us uh, because we'd been the principal agency working against Al Qaeda, helping to understand the threat. We'd done our best you know, to warn the policy community. And the fact of the matter is that this unfolded uh, on our watch. And so the people running the intelligence community felt a very personal responsibility for that. Anybody who's lived in Washington for a while knows that lots of careers end at green felt tables. Uh, that means you're sitting there in front of the Senate or in front of a commission, and, and that was their first reaction. But that lasted about five seconds, uh, if you know these guys. Uh, they quickly moved on from that. And the second thing they knew immediately, and, and, and without equivocation, was that this was Al Qaeda. There was all sorts of speculation at the time who it might be, what the cause were, whether these were tragic accidents. Now, the people who ran our intelligence community were absolutely certain it was Al Qaeda. Uh, they'd watched these people. They knew what their ambition was. They remembered, they remembered the Philippine airplane plot. They remembered instantly that Zacharias Musawi was learning how to fly an airplane in Minnesota. It all came together instantly. Uh, several hours later, when the flight manifest came in, we saw the, the recognized names of Al Qaeda operatives. So that was, a, that, was, that was a very confused day. These people were, were shocked. Uh, the nation was rocked. The best way I can describe it is the way the 9-11 Commission did later on. They, they turned a very uh, clever phrase in this regard. It was a failure of imagination. Nobody could imagine there were people out there that could strike our country in this way. Uh, yet they had. And so uh, the Central Intelligence Agency was evacuated. An order was issued. Everybody needs to get out of the building. Uh, almost nobody left. Uh, everybody stayed, particularly our counterterrorism center. Uh, and they became the nerve center for the war against Al Qaeda for the next 13 years and are still at it today. In fact, you can walk down in the counterterrorism center in the, in the basement at CIA today. And at the cubicles, you'll still see a lot of the calendars uh, set to September 10th, 2001. That's a reminder uh, that each day they come to work, they want to be certain that they do their, their absolute utmost because it may be their responsibility to stop an attack uh, that could happen in the next 24 hours. So that's a, just a telling anecdote of how seriously the people at CIA continue to treat this. Well, the leadership of the agency rushed out of the building. We didn't have a very good continuity of government, continuity of operations plan. It was a little bit more like yabba dabba do. where's the stairway? Uh, because the fourth airplane was still in the air. Uh, and people instantly remembered some reporting that Al Qaeda had a plan to attack with an aircraft the CIA headquarters. And so we're standing there in front of these large plate glass windows on the seventh floor with a plane in the air over, over western Pennsylvania. And uh, so we had to evacuate the building, went down to the place where they print the morning presidential briefing off campus, and uh, tried to make contact with the rest of the national security community. That was confused and chaotic, and, and I think has now gotten fixed, but it was not a good morning. But very quickly, the president came on screen. His national security team uh, was gathered. Uh, his leadership was uh, absolutely essential for his team and for the country that day. The first responders in New York uh, inspired everybody. The, uh, the economy proved more resilient than anybody ever thought. Uh, bounced back immediately. Economic harm was not, not lasting uh, or not, e not even significant. And then we, we started what's been a 13, 13 and a half year uh, war against the people who attacked us and the people who want to emulate them. So um, that left a searing impression on me. Uh, and you should know that the reason we haven't been attacked in the, in the last 13 and a half years, nobody would have guessed that outcome. We all expected that the attack, the arrow might have been in the air. We thought the second attack had already been launched. Uh, and the fact that we haven't suffered a mass casualty attack in 13, 13 and a half years is a remarkable credit to presidential leadership, to the, the, the uh, efficiency and efficacy of our military, and to our intelligence community, who really performed heroically. So what have they done in the last three? What's new? What, what's interesting in terms of an innovation? Some of this will be maybe new to you, some of it not. The um, well, first thing we had to do was, uh, this is an intelligence war, right? And so people that want to attack the United States involving multiple people, involving funds, involving travel, involving coordinated activities, they've got to communicate. They've got to talk to one another. 
So the first thing we had to do was break into their, into their uh, leadership and communication circle, their decision-making cycle. We had to know who they were, where they were, what they were planning, uh, and where we could interdict them, where we could disrupt their attacks. And most of the credit in that area goes, frankly, to our beleaguered national security agency, the folks up at Fort Meade, who did a number of, created a number of new intelligence programs, none of which is currently secret, I can <laughs> tell you with great lament. Uh, but they did exactly that. They got into the decision cycle uh, of Al Qaeda. And frankly, that's how we today continue to detect and disrupt uh, terrorist plots. We intercept uh, and evaluate and analyze their communications. And uh, that's been a remarkable success. And I want to return to that a little bit later because it's a, a cause for some concern today. The second thing that the CIA developed was uh, a way, frankly, to degrade our enemies, uh, their leadership structures. Put it more bluntly, we had to find and kill the people uh, who had ordered this attack and who were plotting new attacks. And in that regard, I'd point out a technological innovation that you're all now familiar with, but nobody understood in 2001, and that's the armed, uh, the armed drone, uh, unmanned aerial vehicle. Predator uh, is the trade name uh, then and now. Uh, there was no armed predator in 2001. Okay, we had an airframe that was on its way to Uzbekistan and the intelligence community and the Defense Department were squabbling about who would pay the freight to get it out there so it could be tested. Well, within several months, uh, there, was, uh, there were more than one uh, armed predators flying over Afghanistan and they've continued to serve as an invaluable tool. In this, in this regard, I'll, I'll borrow from Leon Panetta who was a, a very fine director of the CIA and Secretary of Defense. Probably the, the most accurate uh, standoff weapon system in the history of warfare. Uh, now, that doesn't mean uh, everybody who's killed in a predator strike uh, is guilty and involved in plotting against the United States, but that's who the target is. And it's been a remarkably successful program. And if we had to attack our enemies through any other means, there'd be a lot more innocent people uh, that are dead. And we continue to use it in spots all over the world. So. It was an incredible technical innovation, and frankly, it's going to change the way uh, wars are fought in the future. But it started in the United States, and it started after 9-11. And then the last thing, which I think is maybe most important, but least understood, and happy to share it with you, because you, you have an international perspective and a lot of contacts. Um, there's a global alliance of security services that work every day uh, to share information on terrorism and conduct active operations to take these people off the streets, to stop their plots, to deny them money, to counter their propaganda and their malicious interpretations of Islam. And I'm not talking about dozens. I'm not talking about tens. I'm not even talking about hundreds. Our intelligence community maintains at every given time well into the thousands of relationships with security services, police organizations, intelligence entities, homeland security enemies, border police all over the world. And this is an everyday job. A couple of thousand CIA officers deployed around the world undercover largely in embassies are not going to keep America safe uh, in a global war like this or against proliferators or against the rise of you know, uh, new powers, global powers like China and the resurgence of Russia. It's not good enough. Uh, we do this through partnerships. And you would be surprised at the number of countries who we don't agree with on a lot of diplomatic uh, and economic issues who are stalwart partners in the war on terrorism because it's a threat to all of us, and they work together. In that regard, since many of you follow the Saudi uh, government situation so closely, uh, the Saudis have executed a very efficient and smooth uh, transition in power in the last several weeks, as you know. After King Abdullah's death, Prince Salman was elevated. That was expected. He was the crown prince. Uh, prince Mukran. Uh, a great friend of, US, of the United States and of our national security community, former president of their general intelligence presidency, uh, has been designated as the crown prince next in line to the throne. Uh, but the most interesting piece is below him. Uh, the deputy uh, crown prince is now Mohammed bin Nayef. So this is the first of the next generation. Uh, and Mohammed bin Nayef has been working in the interior ministry 
of Saudi Arabia will describe the, the attention-grabbing shock they suffered in 2003 with the Al-Qaeda attacks in Riyadh. Well, uh, probably the strongest, most clear-eyed, sensible leader and greatest partner that the United States intelligence community, national security community has in Saudi Arabia is Mohammed bin Nayef. You may remember a couple years ago, uh, uh, he nearly escaped death when an Al-Qaeda member uh, pretended uh, to want to <coughs> renounce his membership and leave the organization and go straight, but he said he would only surrender to Mohammed bin Nayef. Right? So Mohammed bin Nayef, in the hospitable traditions of Saudi Arabia, sent an airplane uh, to bring this fellow to him. Well, he had, a, he, had a, uh, he had an explosive device inside his body, came close to uh, Mohammed bin Nayef and, and uh, blew himself to pieces and severely injured uh, Mohammed bin Nayef. That was the third assassination attempt. So this is a guy who is likely at some point in the future to be the ruler of our ally in Saudi Arabia, absolute linchpin, you know, to defeating Al Qaeda. It's a guy who's committed his life to this, to their security and ours, and so he'll be a great partner for us. And he's he's one of dozens of examples of brave people who cooperate with us every day inside foreign governments, and that's to our credit. Uh, before I leave, I'll just I'll just. Uh, share one concern I have with you. We, we've done remarkable work. A lot of people deserve a lot of credit. Uh, but the fact of the matter is th this threat is not uh, resolved. Uh, we still exist under the threat of attack uh, from ISI, from Al-Qaeda, uh, Boko Haram, the franchises of Al-Qaeda, in Yemen in particular, all very dangerous. And uh, what I'm worried about is complacency. Uh, in Washington, in government. I described to you the tools that the National Security Agency developed. Well, th this isn't, you know, you understand what's going on here. They're intercepting people's phone calls and people's email communications and trying to discern from the, the billions of communications that move around the globe every day, uh, who are the bad people and what are they talking about and who are they talking to? It's damn hard to do. It's not hard conceptually. Uh, to understand. Well, most of those programs were, have been exposed in the last year, year and a half by Edward Snowden, who is, by the way, no whistleblower and no patriot and no hero. Uh, he's a traitor. We would have called him a defector in the Cold War. He lives in Moscow under the, under the, under the care and supervision of the FSB, the successor to the KGB. So this is, this is a fellow who set out to harm the United States, and he succeeded. Okay. So that started a debate here in our country that isn't over yet, but is trending in a direction that I, I'm not encouraged by. And that is we're trying to draw the line between respect for personal privacy and keeping government out of your business with giving the government the tools and information it needs to keep us safe. We're probably way overdue. We should have had this conversation a decade ago, but we're getting around to it now. Uh, and the administration, again, I'm not critical of them because, because President Obama has been quite strong in his military uh, efforts against, uh, against Al Qaeda and now against ISI, uh, against the Islamic State. But the fact of the matter is we're now voluntarily as a government choosing to do less than we're authorized to do. So the administration has directed the NSA to scale back uh, some of these surveillance programs to put limitations on how long they can hold information uh, and how they can treat it. These are not required by law, and they're not required because of any abuse on the part of the intelligence community. That's been alleged but never, never proved. So we are voluntarily doing less than we're capable of doing to detect new terrorist plots. And so that's troubling to me. And I think they misunderstand the mood of the country. I'm perfectly prepared to have the government hold information, metadata from the top and bottom of my phone bill uh, or my internet account about when I was on and where I was talking to if it keeps me safe. And I think a lot of Americans feel that way. Nobody at NSA has the slightest interest in your private lives or business lives or mine. They're busy trying to stop acts of terrorism. Um, so my advice to policymakers on this point when they're looking at these NSA programs and deciding which are going to be permitted and which are going to be precluded in the future, is they ought, to, they ought to take the lead of the people down in CTC, you know, who have their calendars set on September 10th. And they ought to set their calendars for September 12th. Uh, 
and realize that they're going to have to answer questions uh, when a second attack comes about whether they were, in fact, doing everything in their powers uh, to protect the United States. And, and I, that's just a useful perspective for them to adopt. And I would encourage you all to get involved, because this is an ongoing debate in Washington. It's going to end up in the Congress when they have legislation coming up to renew this program, the, the central program here in a couple months. And uh, people have to get the mood of the country correctly. And I'm not sure they do right now. Anyway, I look forward to your questions. And sorry for droning on. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. <coughs> Well, I'd like to steal a phrase from uh, Steve that he just used, and, and, and thank you. Thank you who have allowed your sons and daughters to serve. Thank you for those of you that have served uh, and been out there. I, I tell you, I, I remain absolutely convinced that the United States will not fail because of the tremendous people that we have, because of the tremendous moral, ethical, uh, and, and, and leadership that exists. And, uh, and I find that exciting. And I like to share a couple of uh, thoughts uh, and some perspectives that I uh, have had over the past 13 years. Uh, on the 20th of September, I found myself uh, heading east, and we were looking to uh, bring that war to Al-Qaeda, something that America needed. We needed to strike back. And, uh, and we did so by actually taking something from the playbook of World War II. We reached back to the OSS. Uh, where Special Operations Forces and the CIA both trace their lineage. And we said, we've got to work together to do this. It's going to be different than it has been, but we're going to break down those barriers, and we will ex exist, operate together, and we'll start to share. And we'll start to break down those barriers to sharing that have previously existed. And it was incredible. The forward operating base that we established had members of the agency right there. The first flights that went in that took Special Operations Forces uh, into Afghanistan did so under the leadership of the agency who had established a relationship with, we call them the anti-Taliban forces, we call them the leaders of the Northern Alliance, but they had vetted those leaders and when we teamed off those uh, special operations teams, we did so uh, with full faith and confidence that we would be able to achieve success uh, because we knew who our friends were as we turned around and we went after our enemies. I mean, it was, it was incredible. And there's a lesson uh, to be learned for what we did. And that is we had to have people on the ground and you engineered that trust with the indigenous forces because you were there with them side by side. You brought the combat power of the United States to bear. You brought the resources. You brought our allies eventually, but we did so because we were there side by side. And that's something that I'm concerned with that is missing right now, and certainly as we draw down, that will be missing. When we put those first teams in, we actually wanted to just establish a foothold. Winter was coming on, and we did not anticipate that catastrophic success that we had. Um, but why did we have that catastrophic success? We did so because we looked at what those forces needed. Uh, and when we brought in the teams, we started to go to split team operations. And actually, one of the things that we could do is that we could bring air power to bear where it was most needed. At the time, the buzzword was PID, positive identification. We had to have the forces there who could clearly articulate what those targets were. And we had a little bit of benefit at the start because there were those larger formations of Taliban forces that we're fighting. If you fast forward today, our enemies are smart and they learn from us and they scatter, and no longer do they have those massive formations there. So the only way that we're going to be able to positively identify who we need to go after are going to be if we have somebody on the ground to do so, somebody that we trust that can bring that back to bear in a kinetic fight. Um, and the forces that we were with valued those combat controllers. There's a, a good friend of mine, Calvin Markham, who was in fighting the Taliban around Kabul. And they were bringing air power strikes after air power strikes after air power strikes to bear. And then their positions started to come under attack. And suddenly he found himself buried by the forces that he was with, by the Northern Alliance. And Calvin's a pretty big guy. And as he was trying to fight his way out from underneath all these guys who were suddenly on top of him and figure out what was going on, what they said was, you are more important than other, any of us because you are synchronizing our effects with that air power out there and we can't afford to lose you. 
So that's the strength of the relationship that we brought to bear. Um, and it's missing to a certain extent today. We also obliquely brought to bear the other power of America, and that is that our men and women go forward. And they're forward in the agency, they're forward in State Department, they're forward in USAID, they're forward certainly in the military. Um, Dosan was one of the leaders of the Northern Alliance, and as he came by, he heard a female voice on the radio that, that uh, one of our controllers was talking to, um, working with a gunship. On the AC-130 gunship, we have fire control officers. And uh, Captain Allison uh, Black, who was uh, talking to the controller at the time, and Dosan was just amazed, and he said, who is that? Where is she? And they said, well, she's up there in that gunship. And he said, you're kidding me. He said, no. So he grabbed another radio that was on a Taliban frequency, and he said, the Americans hate you so much that they sent their women to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. <laughs> and then later, that same person wanted American women to go to the villages with them and show what uh, women can do when they are free. So I'll tell you that, that our presence there comes in so many ways. And he's currently the vice president of Afghanistan. <laughs> right. It, and so what did we learn at the start? Well, we learned that we needed speed of maneuver. We needed the agility to respond. The battlefield was different than anything that we had seen, and quite honestly, it's what the battlefields are today. There's not those fixed lines that we understood that I studied in our war college. There's not the World War II lines of advance. Our, our, our troops are placed different areas, and what we need to be is smart to bring the most appropriate power to bear. When we went into Afghanistan, we wanted to deny the enemy a safe haven. And now we need to expand that thinking of what a safe haven really was. We were thinking in terms of the geography of terrain, but in fact that safe haven exists in our own freedoms. And I don't want to lose our freedoms, but we need to understand what the enemy's doing. When I was in NATO, we were concerned because the enemy knew where they could go and what country they could go to and they could openly recruit. What country could they go to and they could openly raise money? What country could they go to and do other things because they exploited our own laws against us. We need to understand that and adapt to it. And so the fight is different. The fight is on the battlefield, but it is with all those elements of national power that we talked about. Probably the most important lesson I think that we learned, um, and, and I absolutely credit General Stan McChrystal for bringing this to bear, and he preceded Admiral Bill McRaven at Joint Special Operations Command. And Stan started studying the way that we operated, and he came up with a mode of, of operating. And that was find, fix, finish, exploit, analyze, and disseminate. The find and fix was we had to find those enemies. We had to know where they were. Had to fix that site so that you could bring in a surgical strike. You could bring in operators on the ground. Because quite honestly, we wanted to roll folks up. We wanted to gather intelligence off the objective from them. We wanted to know what they knew and figure out where this next network went. So that was the finish part. But then exploit. What did we pull off that objective? What did we learn immediately so you could go hit another target, which absolutely was unknown of the way that we operated? And then analyze further what we had pulled off an objective and disseminate. And that required the intelligence fusion cells. That required brave people who took that institutional risk to break down barriers and instead of holding information, pushing to share it. And that's with the United States, with our allies, with our close partners. And that to me has been one of the tremendous revolutions that we've had is that we break down those barriers to sharing. And why is that important now? Part of it is because there are forces from other countries that are operating in areas that we don't have the ability to operate in. Either we can't go there or we don't have enough people to be there as well, or we've got some other restriction on us. And so when we break down those barriers to sharing, we have now exploited um, a weakness that we previously had, and we've denied the enemy that weakness. And so what does that mean for today? If you look at all the areas in which we're operating, well, that find, fix, finish meant that we had that agility to go to different areas. We've now constrained ourselves. You know, any time that we've taken something away from our playbook and said we're not going to introduce ground forces, 
we have hampered ourselves. Just as we said we have restricted the NSA, we have now restricted the United States from operating the way that we need to, and I'm concerned about that. When we talk about that exploitation, what does it mean? Well, it requires understanding as well. And we need to break down more barriers to sharing and bring in more. And, and, and where is that from? Uh, I'll tell you, there's think tanks out there, there's universities out there. Uh, there are abilities to reach out and, and find out from scholars and better understand who it is that we're dealing with. But at the end of the day, as we've said, the role of the United States military is absolutely kill those who need to be killed, but it's to buy us time. And we have always said that. If you talk to anybody in the military, they've said we cannot kill our way to success. What we can do, though, is to grade the enemy's ability to take action against us. We can work with our indigenous partners. We can build them stronger. We can provide time for that generational change that we talked about that is going to require an all-of-government, all-of-nation approach to turn around and affect that. And we can identify where those threats are and, quite honestly, go after them. Those threats that are so serious right now that we can't afford to wait for other uh, elements of power to work. We, we have done that extremely well. Those fusion cells that we've talked to have brought together the tremendous aspects of justice and treasury and government agencies and the military. And we've looked at each other and we've said, I can't operate there. Can you do? What can you do with this? Where do we go? We are a nation of laws and, and our foundation is on our constitution. It's got to stay that way. But we've got to ask ourselves, what should we be looking at and what do we need to change? And what threats are out there that we are allowing the enemy to bring against us because we haven't sat down and talked about it? As we've said, Sometimes our requirement to act does not allow us a great deal of time to analyze, but certainly it's incumbent upon the way that we look at it to analyze post-event, which is why after-action reports and after-mission reviews are so important to us. And what authorities have we given ourselves now? I I'll tell you what, I had tremendous authority when I had NATO forces uh, underneath me and we were fighting the fight of I could, I could appropriately share uh, information I could provide support to them through U.S. logistics uh, structures. Certainly, we would bring those fires to bear. But every time we run into a post-conflict and we start to draw down, we start to draw back, we remove all those authorities. And we need to ask ourselves, what can we not afford to remove? So the transition of the military over the past 13 years has been that agility, the ability to jump to multiple target sets, over a relatively short period of time. We've got to have the national will to do so. We have quite honestly had a luxury of time because for 13 years we've been able to operate, but we've got to retain that same luxury. We can't afford for the United States to worry of the requirement to be out there fighting. And we've got to continue to share. We should not remove authorities that currently exist for information sharing within the United States government and with our close allies and partners and we've got to look for ways to better enhance it. At the end of the day, I am, I am very confident that if we are allowed to continue to operate at this high level that we've achieved, we will continue to provide the required uh, success in the mission and the required protection to the United States and security and the stability that we need. But if we start to restrict that force, then we're going to have concerns. But it is. Uh, it's been my pleasure to have had uh, the experiences I did to serve with the great people I do. My thanks to all the men and women who are out there right now fighting, and I too look forward to your questions. Thank you. We can't keep all of you here too long, but we do have time for a couple of questions. And there are microphones uh, in either either aisle. So uh, Emily Ann's got one of them, and um, Amanda's got the other one. So, all right, that uh, the microphone's on its way over to you, sir. All right, thank you. I'm Mick Taylor. I'd like to find out, as you said, Texas is an industrial power. What kind of threat do you see to the to the state of Texas and its industry? You know, as you say, we have a lot of oil and gas industries, refining, production. Et cetera, et cetera. We've got computer industries and many other industries. And my question is, what what kind of a threat is there to this state? 
take that up and just offer a couple, couple of quick thoughts. Um, it goes back to Steve's comment from the 9-11 report, which in some ways is a failure of imagination. If we knew exactly what the threat was, then we could you know, be taking steps to, to counter it right now. But there's a, n a number of, I don't want to fear monger too much, but there are a number of vulnerabilities we have, um, whether our electric grid, whether our, our, uh, our refineries, our, our oil and gas development. Um, the, the enemy knows that this has become a source of America's strength and it's located here, here in Texas. Um, uh, I don't want to get into immigration policy. I understand that that's complicated, but I do have worries about an unsecured border. Um, and, uh, you know, some of the uh, Islamic terrorist groups have been looking for ways to, to, to come across. And so um, just as we were not expecting guys using box cutters on civilian airplanes to cause 9-11. Um, we may not be expecting where the, where the next one could, could come from. Um, well, I, I also oh, recall sorry, several years ago when North Korea announced its uh, nuclear attack plan on the United States, uh, they announced that they would attack Washington, D.C., Los Angeles, and Austin. Yeah, that's right. So, <laughs> <laughs> they don't have the missiles yet. Don't worry. Okay. Yeah. Now I'm scared. Yeah. No, I, I, would just, uh, I would just add, following up on the, your comment about possible physical attack, um, the whole cybersecurity issue is, you know, enormously complicated and more dangerous, I think, than any of us uh, understands, and it's getting worse every day. And um, I guess my call is, is mainly one for leadership from Washington right now. Uh, we're not prepared. We don't have the right kind of relationship between the government uh, and the private sector in terms of sharing of information, liability, and other protections. We not only don't have comprehensive uh, cyber legislation out of the U.S. Congress, we don't have any cyber legislation. Um, and that's a threat that troubles me greatly. And every business, every, every individual uh, is vulnerable to that. It's a new kind of threat. It knows no borders. Uh, it's difficult to attribute who's attacking you or understand their motives. We don't have international law yet so that we understand when somebody's committed an act of war against us and we can attack them in response, uh, or when somebody simply inconvenienced us or somebody's simply trying to steal money from us. So uh, this is a looming threat. Uh, it's getting worse all the time. Uh, the national leadership that we need in this area has not been forthcoming. And to the extent, again, I call on you, if you can bring pressure to bear on your representatives in the Congress and other people that you deal with, um, this won't be a surprise to anybody, but it will be an unpleasant uh, reality when it arrives. Cyber aspects exist in every element of intelligence. It, it has changed the intelligence world completely, 100% in every discipline from espionage to surveillance. It's doing the same in military. Uh, affairs. It's, it's already done this in, in commercial and, and business applications. It's a new world, uh, yet it's a vulnerable world. And so uh, that's, what, that's what I would look at, that's what I would invest in, and that's what I would demand of my representatives in Washington that we get better leadership on right now is cybersecurity. I mentioned before that our enemies may be evil, but they're not stupid. Um, it has surprised us as we've been through those what-if drills of what would be the most horrendous attacks, what do we need to defend against, and we've looked at it. And quite honestly, I've been shocked that we have not seen some other things. I mean, that is tremendous credit to our intelligence and our security uh, agencies um, to have prevented and precluded those attacks. But the more Western influence that goes over, the foreign fighters that we talked about, um, the Americans we know have gone there, the more that they understand about the psyche of America, perhaps the more that they will be willing to do something that has not been otherwise considered. Um, and, and so you, and when you look at that, um, the point is that the enemy is continuing in their mission planning sequence. We've got to continue in our due diligence to disrupt that mission planning sequence. There's one back here. Okay. Yes, thank you all for your service. And I had a question. Do you find any peaceful strains within Islam? And the reason I ask is because reading the Quran, there's three options. They are to convert, kill, or subjugate the enemy. So if we're facing an enemy that believes that, what are the peaceful options? Uh, you know, I... So I've heard a similar argument from uh, some many commentators uh, recently. Um, 
I think it is unfair to uh, take one passage from uh, the Quran or a hadith uh, and apply it to 1.6 billion Muslims worldwide. I think it might be more helpful to observe the behavior of the lived religion of the 1.6 billion Muslims in the world. And the lived religion of those 1.6 billion is that virtually none of them engage in acts of terrorism. If you count up every single member of every single jihadist group in the world, let's just say that you have 500,000 of them. That amounts to less than one quarter of 1% of the world's Muslims. I'm not trying to be politically correct here. I hate political correctness. Uh, but it's simply true, statistically, factually, that almost none of the world's Muslims uh, practice terrorism. Um, that's a helpful thing for us to keep in mind. When I say the war on terror is a war against jihadists, I do mean jihadists. It's a specific ideology that borrows the rhetoric, the language, the symbols, the scriptures of Islam, and they, uh, they direct their arguments against a Muslim audience and try to get recruits from that population. But by and large, they failed. Let me follow up on, on that question, if I may. Uh, you know, since 9-11, uh, there have been several very high-profile attacks in the United States, you know, from the John Malvo sniper uh, to the Major Nadal uh, Fort Hood massacre, Boston Marathon, so on and so on. But in addition to those, you know, there have been hundreds of attempted attacks on our, uh, on our citizens that were interdicted, uh, that narrowly failed, and, uh, and, and the list just goes on and on. But, uh, you know, we do not profile uh, Muslims in this country or Middle Eastern uh, uh, people of, of Muslim faith. We won't even identify them as a potential threat uh, to our country uh, and to our safety, either here or, or on the battlefield, apparently. Um, my question is, do you believe that there will come a time when, when we will identify this enemy and, and actually begin to profile those people in, in our country who intend us harm, uh, or do you think that's something that will probably never happen? Well, well let me, uh, it's a great question, Kyle, thanks, and something I've worked on a bit and given a lot of thought to, and um, I, I'll say I, I hope not, uh, because, you know, one of the things that makes America great is our freedoms, our freedom of religion, our civil liberties, um, and, you know, as we've been talking, it's, it's a difficult balance where, uh, you know, we've, we've got to maintain those, we've got to maintain our, our values as a society, and also remember that our best allies in the fight against jihadism are other Muslims, Muslims who don't subscribe to that. Muslims who can be free to make arguments, say no, that's not what my faith says, and we want to, uh, we want to, you know, shun and marginalize these jihadists. Um, but also, a lot of these Muslims are some of our best informants. Uh, you know, these guys can all say from their their time in, in theater that uh, you know we, you know, uh, you know, Afghan Muslims, Iraqi Muslims fighting alongside Americans against the terrorists, and um, and so we need to remember that they're some of our our best allies. But also, you know, like Paul, I don't think any of us up here would subscribe to political correctness. It still is a fact that the majority of the uh, terrorist attacks being launched against the West these days are coming from people acting in the name of Islam, and they think that they're being good Muslims, and that's something that we really need to uh, to, 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 to wrestle with. Um, and I, I do worry that some of the current administration's kind of sanitized language and refu refusing to use the word Islam about any of this is not fooling anybody, because other Muslims around the world who are not jihadists will tell you that uh, that it's people acting in the name of Islam. And when they recognize that and we don't seem to, um, then that, that delegitimizes our, our credibility. So it's a really, it's a really difficult, um, it's a really difficult balance. Yeah, I, I think there's two kind of opposing mistakes we can fall into. One is to say terrorism has nothing to do with Islam. And I think that's what the current administration is saying. You know, let's have a summit on violent extremism. Uh, and the other opposite extreme is to say Islam is the problem. You know, all Muslims are terrorists. And I think neither of these things are true. I think there's a very complex situation going on here where the jihadists, as I said, use Islamic language symbols, uh, rhetoric, and scriptures, and they're trying to persuade fellow Mus other Muslims uh, to join their cause. And so it's a very difficult situation, and we need to make the distinction between the jihadists and Muslims and understand, as Will said, most Muslims are on our side with this. I think that uh, you can take a look at uh, some of the nations around the world that have been there side by side with us. Turkey happens to be a NATO ally, um, and they have been with us. 
perhaps with the uh, new president who was their prime minister, who was their president, kind of following along the lines of Putin, um, things are a little bit different than they used to be, but, but Turkey is there with us. Jordan was one of the first nations that came and joined uh, the coalition with us in 2001. And in fact, uh, in November of 2001, the King of Jordan addressed Parliament and gave a tremendous speech that I would, I would say take a look at and, and look at what his views were on the uh, threat uh, that this uh, poses. So, so we do have uh, tremendous allies uh, in uh, many members of uh, Muslim faith. On the other side, we need to turn around and say, and I think I'm going to adopt what Paul's been saying, it's, it's jihadists and where the jihadists come from. Um, if you look at it in order to have a jihad, an imam somewhere had to say it was okay to do this, so it is religion-oriented, but certainly not the mainstream. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. My name's Jim Woodcock. Let me thank you for coming this evening. It's been, been a great conversation. Uh, I want to go back to the Middle East. I'm not sure we can qualify who's jihadist and who's, <laughs> who's a terrorist this evening, but I've traveled in Libya, I've traveled in Syria, I've traveled in Egypt. And I found the people to be pretty happy. But we had the Arab Spring, and now we back Gaddafi. Uh, I mean, back getting Gaddafi out, we back getting the president of Egypt out, and now we're back and getting the president of Syria out. Seems like we're making the wrong choices with those, but I guess my question is, we talk about now supporting our friends in those countries, and I, I, my question is, how do we decide who our friends are in the countries where nobody, uh, they're fighting each other all over the place? <laughs> well, yeah, it sounds like an intelligence problem. <laughs> I just asked the CIA, tell me who my friends are. That's right. That's right. Yeah, you know, there's, there's an old saying that I've heard way too often, but uh, actually watched uh, unfold too often as well, and, and that is in Washington there are only two kinds of things. There are uh, intelligence failures and policy successes. Uh, so I I if you think about that, so it's a thankless job, but it, that's a call for intelligence, you know? And it's one of the things that we discovered, Paul will know this because he's been on the ground trying to do it, trying to understand the, the, the cultural terrain uh, of a place where we're required to fight or a country we're required to understand. The days of the Cold War are over, you know, where we can spend months at a time or years writing a national intelligence estimate about, you know, who's on the pull-up bureau and who stands next to who on May Day and on Lenin's tomb and things like this, you know, sort of a slow-moving uh, monolith that we don't want to have to fight, but uh, sort of works at a pace that we can understand. That's not what's happening in the Middle East today. You see the, the disintegration of, of Libyan society. There's a possibility that the UN special coordinator will be able to pull a rabbit out of the hat here and create some governance in Tripoli. I wouldn't bet on it. Uh, so that's looking like a, like a free fire zone, like a potential terrorist safe haven that the Egyptians will gladly fill uh, if there's a vacuum left there. So uh, that's a real challenge for intelligence. It means uh, human intelligence. It means technical intelligence. It means understanding how things change from day to day. It means understanding cultural terrain, tribes, sex, families. These societies are not organized the same way, uh, the same way we are. So uh, I, guess, I guess I'm arguing for the intelligence community's bu budget uh, here. Uh, it's not a place that you want to skimp. Because the costs of getting it wrong or not understanding well enough to inform good decisions are pretty high. Uh, and so I, what you're describing is entirely accurate. It's principally an intelligence problem. And the relationships, the alliances we have with other people around the world are really the only key to solving it. A handful of CIA officers who actually are no longer in this, Libya since the entire presence was pulled out uh, for safety reasons some time ago can't help understand what's happening in that society. You need local partners. And, and fortunately, we have them most places. Uh, people to help interpret their neighborhoods, their societies for us in ways that we can't understand uh, as Americans. So that, that's not a very satisfying answer, but I think you're right. I think it's a challenge. And I think only investing in smart US intelligence uh, is going to help us see it through. I think time for one more question because we can't stand between you and dinner. So, all right, okay, here we go. All right. Well, given the rise and the obvious success of ISIS across the Middle East, and then that coupled with the recent collapse of the government in Yemen, is the Saudi Arabia oil supply at risk? Um, 
I'll take a quick one at that. Uh, yes, I, I think it is. Um, although, uh, go back to my earlier comments that the the Saudis have learned from you know the 2006 attack on the Abqaiq refinery, certainly from you know some of these other other uh, other other attacks we've mentioned before. Um, so just as the risk is more acute for them, uh, their their security is also also a lot better. But it's a big swath of sand, and there's a lot of bad actors uh, pretty much on on all on all sides there. Um, and so uh, so they're only as good as they are each each day. Uh, no, uh, <laughs> he's wrong. Okay. Um, Diversity of opinion. That's right. Yeah. I mean, look, the, 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 the Six-Day War, the 73 War, the Iranian Revolution, uh, the Israeli-Palestinian mass, the I Iraq-Iran War, the Gulf War, the Iraq War, Saudi keeps pumping oil. You know, there have been some fluctuations, but they just keep pumping oil. So far, in 50 years, the, the, I, if I think, I think this is true, the greatest reduction in Saudi uh, oil production ever was their own embargo. Like, they're the ones who did it to themselves. Um, so I think that the Saudis have actually proven to be pretty resilient uh, to regional instability, pretty insulated from it. Uh, so there's that. Any maybe? We've had a yes and a no. Do you want to okay, all right. Not going to break the tie. Okay, all right. Well, like I said, my, my, mindful of the time, uh, we're going to wrap up our panel. We, we're going to have just a, a quick closing word for you from our chairman of the board, George C. So, anyway, so. so. All right. And, and I promise this will be quick. You all have been very patient and, and generous with your time. I just want to thank all the co-hosts that are here tonight. And in particular, I want to thank Claudia and Modesta, who've been really great friends of my family for decades. and. Thank you for being here. And also Ernie Angelo, who I first met on the 1980 Reagan campaign. So that's a long time ago. So thanks for being here. One brief word in closing. So how often do you get to be a part of something that has a strategic imperative associated with it in, uh, in national security and in philanthropy? It just doesn't come along very often. And I, I want to bring up one man before I close named Tommy Hitchcock which probably nobody in the room has ever heard of. But Tommy Hitchcock was the Michael Jordan of his time in the 1920s. He was a polo player. And in the World War I, he lied about his age and flew fighter planes uh, because he was so desperate to serve his country. And in World War II, he was too old to get into the Army Air Corps and fly over Europe, but he was assigned with the P-51 Mustang. Because m many of you in the room will remember that the air campaign in Europe, uh, initially, the idea was we were going to have these fast bombers that flew really high and really fast, and the Luftwaffe couldn't touch them, and we were going to bomb Germany into submission. The only problem was it, it didn't work. <laughs> we just had catastrophic losses over Fortress Europe up until 1944. And the American uh, command thought that the P-51 should have an American engine in it, and Hitchcock argued for a Rolls-Royce engine, which politically was a piece of dynamite, because you know, America's, oh, we're not going to have a British engine in our plane. Well, Hitchcock finally won the argument, and from January to June of 1944, the P-51 Mustang became the most effective fighter plane on the continent and wiped out the Luftwaffe, shot down several thousand planes, leaving empty skies above the Normandy beaches. Think about how many thousands of men would have died that day on top of the losses we already incurred if this great patriot, Hitchcock, hadn't stood up and made a stand and made a big difference. What we would like to ask you, those of you in the room to consider is we need partners. Bill Powers and Greg Finvez, the two top officials at UT, could be anywhere t tonight. They're here in Midland because they love Midland and they love the Clements Center. And, but they alone and the University of Texas alone and the Clements family alone can't make this the great institution it needs to be to impact the future of American national security policy. So I would ask you all to consider partnering with us and being a part of this and helping us raise up the next generation of Tommy Hitchcocks to serve this country, both in terms of the military and the national security establishment, but also in academia. So our young people don't go hear things that are, that are untrue or way off the deep end, but they hear sound, solid, conservative principles and ideals that are patriotic about their country in national security and history training. So thank you again for being here tonight. We really appreciate it, and we're adjourned. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.